Warm welcome back and into our next session, Financing Deep Tech Innovation. I'd like to introduce our guests onto the stage, hosted by Nicholas Bergman, the CEO of Intergalactic Industries. We also have Francesca Bria, the president of CDP Venture Capital, and Herman Hauser, the co-founder of Amadeus Capital and the EIC Fund. Thank you very much, Nicholas. The floor is yours. So. We've got lots of money here. What we're going to do with it? That's the question, basically. Yeah. We, we got we got a lot of money on stage now, um, definitely. So uh, welcome, everyone. We just said good to see so many people still here, although it's 20 to 6, and it's been a full day, long day for most people. Yeah. So yes, uh, welcome. We're going to discuss uh, deep tech investing and how to how to do it actually, and what's the repercussions for Europe and, and all that. If, Ms. Francesca Bria from, uh, just so I get it right, the Italian National Innovation Fund. And usually we don't brag about money, but five billion euros under management, right? And uh, the distinguished Mr. Herman Hauser, Dr. Herman Hauser from uh, Amadeus Capital, who actually turned 25 yesterday. Not Herman, but the fund. Uh, so uh, congratulations to that. Thank you. And as I said, uh, myself, I spent roughly 20 years as a business angel in deep tech. So uh, we're going to discuss some of these issues here. And the first thing I was thinking about was just give, give me some reflections on your ecosystems, like from Italy, for example, to start with. Uh, yeah. Deep tech, innovation, what's happening in your part of the world? Okay, so good afternoon, Brussels. It's really great to see people still here. Uh, I think from the Italian ecosystem, I'm going to give you some good news, I would say, because we are seeing the, we are as a fund infrastructuring, let's say, the Italian ecosystem and the market. And we started with 1 billion fund three years ago, and we now have 5.3 billion of asset under management. And also the Italian market, Two years ago, it was about 600 million investment in VC, so very low compared to our peers. And now we're expecting 2.5 billion by the end of the year. So we see the market responding. So our role is to invest in all the cycles, all the life cycles of the startup from early seed uh, until the large ventures. And we invest in indirect form, so we have a, a 10 funds which are active. One fund is a fund of funds, so we have now invested in 22 uh, venture capital funds in key sectors of the Italian economy. We have a network of 20 next generation accelerators, uh, so really they attract a lot of private money, they attract uh, the network of business industries, corporates, and also other form of investors. And then it, 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 we have a, a, a fund which is a technology transfer fund and we have created five hubs of technology transfer throughout Italy in sectors like robotics, advanced robotics, life sciences, aerospace, AI and quantum computing and uh, agri-tech. And geographically? And geographically okay, distributed, yeah, yeah. because I think this is something maybe we want to discuss, mm -hmm. you know, how we can f foster, let's say, the territorial potential mm -hmm. and have it, have it more widespread yeah. throughout Europe and Italy. And then we have 300 companies in our portfolio. So that's where, of course, uh, we also invest and we work a lot with the European Innovation Council and let's say with all the actors, also the European Investment Fund, uh, to kind of try to co-invest. So we are part of the multi-billion uh, multi uh, fund that the EIF set up for the Tech Champion Initiative. And, uh, and of course, we also want to make sure that in our, the companies in our portfolio can be successful in the EIC accelerator and so on. We see a leverage very big in the market at this, at this point, so also 2.7%, something like that. So I think it's very good news. And, um, and I think uh, to say maybe 
Uh, one side, uh, the corporates, I think they make a difference because we see where Italy can have an industrial potential. For example, we have a region, but we can discuss it maybe a bit later, I don't want to monopolize, but we, have, we are very strong in the automotive sector in the center of Italy, the Emilia region. Uh, we have the aerospace uh, value chain present in Italy. Uh, we have potential, for example, now we have attracted the exascale supercomputer from the European Commission, Leonardo, in the Technopole in Emilia-Romagna, the Data Valley. So we are building a deep tech uh, transfer and accelerator there. Uh, so where we see we have strong industrial potential and a network of academic centers, universities, and then public and private investors, that's where we think we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I mean, I, th I find it interesting also from a Nordic perspective where you have good combination of, of the investors, the startups, and also the established players, the established industries. I mean, automotive, you say, we have automotive in Sweden as well. We have a lot of healthcare in Sweden, etc. cetera. So uh, how do you see it now from a UK perspective, Herman, uh, in this regard? Yes, well, before I start, I, I want to make three comments, one on the UK, one on my native Austria, and then uh, on the EIC, on the European environment as a whole. But I'll start off with uh, a, a sort of global perspective of where uh, the number one ecosystems are, and there is no doubt that Silicon Valley, of course, is still the leading ecosystem that everybody looks up to. Uh, maybe next in the hierarchy would be the UK, because UK is about... Uh, <clears throat> oh, that's what you think now, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, it is, is, is uh, by far the most vibrant uh, VC and uh, high-tech community in, in Europe. Uh, then comes Europe, uh, and then comes Austria right there. Uh, <clears throat> And the gradient uh, used to be very steep. The order is still the same. Silicon Valley is still up there. The UK is still ahead of uh, Europe. But the gradient has become a lot shallower. And even Austria now has three unicorns. So things are developing uh, in the right way. So uh, I've spent you know, half of my life in, in the UK, in Cambridge in particular, and Cambridge is one of those uh, deep technology hubs. We've got about uh, 5,000 <coughs> high technology companies employing um, some uh, 70,000 people. Uh, I think we've got um, 15 unicorns now in Cambridge, uh, only seven of which had anything to do with me, and two of them uh, have become uh, techacorns. So these are uh, you know, t $10 billion companies. So that ecosystem has matured and is, uh, is actually working very well. It's firing on all cylinders. Uh, but there are now lots of ecosystems all around Europe uh, <coughs> developing very successful, and people just have to understand that uh, uh, these ecosystems are local. Uh, you do need a, a world-class university uh, to build an ecosystem around. You do need to have the uh, VC community, uh, the lawyers, the accountants uh, that know how to deal with companies that won't have profits for a long time, uh, where the, you know, the overriding accounting principle is cash. Uh, you, know, you don't get into trouble because you're making losses. You get into trouble if you run out of cash. So uh, you know, understanding the importance of cash ab above anything else uh, is something that these ecosystems have to learn. Uh, last but not least, a few words on, on my native Austria. I've been running uh, a summer school in my native Tyrol, uh, uh, in the mountains, uh, in a, on a wonderful place called um, uh, Wattens near Innsbruck. Uh, I've been running it for uh, eight years now, uh, when my cousin told me, you need to do something in Austria, you know, it's really happening. I said, Yuzi, there is nothing happening in Austria, there's no chance, but he wouldn't uh, let go. Uh, so I said, I will do one thing. I'll uh, take the summer school program that I have participated in for 15 years in Cambridge. I use that Cambridge model with the Cambridge team. I will run it in the Tyrol. I will prove to you that there are no interesting tales, and then you leave me alone. The first year, we had 15 fantastic deals, just as good as the deals that we, we had in the UK, which showed to me that if you make an effort, uh, these deals come out of the woodwork. Uh, and uh, the eight years uh, that we've now run this summer school at has produced alumni and, and uh, companies that have raised over 200 million euros. 
So guys, if Austria can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. And also, I mean, you should say, uh, yeah, thanks, Herman. I have worth an applause, right, yeah, of course, <laughs> for Austria. Uh, but also, I mean, you say you collect unicorns then. Seven is a good start. Um, unfortunately, I've been collecting unicorns in the opposite way, saying no to them very early on. So uh, we can talk about that later. But I get just a reflection. I said no to Spotify, so you are in good company. <laughs> I said no to Spotify earlier than you did, I can say. But anyway, <laughs> right. uh, but what's interesting, I can, I can see from the ecosystem, is that uh, all these startups, the successful ones, I see quite a lot of these entrepreneurs that are cashing in, doing something else, starting funds, doing their own investments, and actually moving from a lot of gaming, software, IT-centered stuff to more deep tech, uh, sustainability, impact, investing. I can see that a lot in the Nordics. Is that something you've seen as well? <laughs> Well, I think there is an imperative, the one of decarbonizing the economy and the value chains, making them more resilient and obviously digitalizing. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I mean, this is not by chance that the first kind of real uh, Europe investment plan, the next generation EU, has these clear priorities, digitization, the green transition, and also doing that with social cohesion. So making sure that you have an impact and the return that's also good for society. I think we also, as a fund, run transversal priorities, as we say. One is sustainability. Uh, the, the other one is to um, shorten the divides, territorial divides, but also, for example, gender mm -hmm. uh, divides. So we are making sure that we have women founders and that they invest on the investor side. Also, the key teams have women investing and that this is more balanced in society. And I think the deep tech is, um, well, just the European uh, agency for e the energy agency said we need 65% uh, of the clean technologies we need to have 70% of CO2 reductions yeah. are present, but they're still in the lab. Mm -hmm. So this is one example where we need to get the key technologies, the key disruptive technologies out. So there is a financing gap there, but also a need to translate those products, those technologies out there in society. And I think that's why today we have a much more assertive industrial policy in Europe and a much more strategic Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, having to do also with quantum, with microprocessors, with uh, photonics, with uh, green hydrogen, with batteries, with the key kind of um, technologies that are empowering the value chains of the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where Europe wants to compete to yeah. be leading again. I think in green innovation as priority, but to get to green innovation, you need all these different components. And I think that's, that's why deep tech, I think it's an imperative, both coming from the industries that need to, the big companies, yeah? They need to understand how this is done, to decarbonize, to get more innovative. And also for broadly, I I think that venture capital is perceived as a, as a, as a key part mm -hmm. of a broader economic and industrial policy and strategy. And I don't think this was the case a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I see these big changes on one side, and maybe this is the global scenarios that we're seeing also. I see a change with Europe becoming much more strategic and unleashing all the instruments from venture capital to subsidies to investments to the big policy and regulatory changes. And I think it's going to be up to us. And actually, I think this community has a amazingly important role to make it happen. And then I think from the business side, it is really, uh, you look at the deep tech, mm -hmm. because that's where you're going to make a difference, because that's with those kind of technologies that you can have scale and you can differentiate, yeah. not only from the business side, but also from the technology and design side. Thank you. Uh, uh, one challenge that I've seen, I mean, having worked with deep tech companies for the last 20 plus years myself, is the time it takes. Uh, I mean, I, I remember I invested in one company in 2006, and they will probably get their first commercial customers next year, meaning that we probably took it out of the lab like f at least five or eight years too early. Uh, but th th for me, that has been a challenge in the past. Uh, I can get a sense that this is changing a bit. Uh, have you can you say that you've seen yes. that it's actually deep tech is getting faster nowadays? 
I, I think it is. Uh, I mean, I've been doing deep tech all my life. Uh, you know, we, you were kind enough to mention our 25th anniversary when we did, did deep tech uh, 25 years ago. It was quite a lonely endeavor. Uh, fortunately, there are many more funds now that are willing to, to do deep tech, uh, and it's an acquired taste. It, it uh, <clears throat> does need a little bit of uh, sector expertise to, to do a good, good job in, in deep tech. But one of the key slides that we have uh, at Amadeus to convince limiteds to give us money is exactly the slide of the speed with which we can now tape, take uh, deep tech breakthroughs and make successful companies out of them produce products uh, and services. And of course, this is also <clears throat> the key object objective of the EIC, uh, which was set up uh, to put 10 billion euros into breakthrough technologies in Europe and crowding in uh, <clears throat> the market venture capital as well. Uh, and that uh, uh, crowding in has worked extremely well. It's one of the things that I pushed very hard for uh, when I uh, chaired the advisory board that uh, set up the rules for the EIC, where I insisted <clears throat> that we could only invest in companies if at least 50% of the money came from the market. And the two reasons I had for that, and I'm very glad that everybody uh, on the committee agreed, was that one, uh, we needed the due diligence capability of the market to help us make a sensible decision and not waste the money, as many government funds have, have done over the years, investing in, in companies that we really shouldn't invest in because it ties up good people doing the wrong thing. Uh, so that was one uh, reason. Uh, but the other reason, <clears throat> uh, of course, was uh, that we, if we were accused of crowding out the market, of competing with the market, uh, that would be uh, politically unacceptable. Uh, and this rule of at least 50% of the money coming from the market has worked extremely well. In fact, we're very proud that for every euro that we invest in a company as the European Innovation Council, we now get three euros from the market. So it's actually not a 10 billion euro initiative, it's more like a 30 billion euro initiative. So deep tech has arrived. Uh, however, the uh, bad news still is that <clears throat> even with the EIC, we still have only a quarter of the venture capital that America spends on deep tech. And uh, the same thing is true for China, uh, not just for the venture capital, but for the government intervention that uh, we see in China, <clears throat> which is even larger uh, in terms of the amount that goes into deep tech uh, than all the venture capital companies uh, in the US. So we, we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Just one comment that you have, uh, I mean, Amadeus is a closed end fund, right? Uh, do you see that as a challenge in deep tech? Do you have longer fund cycles than uh, uh, other VCs? It, it is um, a challenge in some areas of deep tech. Uh, materials investments normally uh, take longer than 10 years, and drug development takes longer than years. So there are some life science funds now that get 15-year uh, periods, but it's still very much uh, the exception. Yeah. Uh, most of deep tech, though, um, can be done with a a 10-year uh, close-to-end fund, and let's not forget, they're always extensions. So if you actually look at how long these funds last, you know, we recently uh, finally had a fantastic exit at, uh, at 2 billion euros, and that company had been in our fund for 18 years. Yep. So, uh, you know, you do I'm get I'm looking forward to that for my 16-year-old company then, of course. Uh, but I mean, for you, you, I mean, you also have a fund of fund part. Yeah, uh, yeah. How do you see that mm, with longer fund no, cycles? I, I totally agree. Well, I think uh, it's encouraging to see 25% of uh, VC uh, investments in the EU being deep tech. And I think this shows a trend um, that is important. Um, I agree. I, I think there is this question of, okay, it's slower to get to, uh, to do a first round or to get to the market, but then uh, it can scale much quicker, mm -hmm. it can have a return on investment that's bigger, and, um, and then Deeper. I think, yeah, and then, and so it pays off, so it has a, a, an operational leverage which is 
really big and you can create a lot of value there. Mm -hmm. So I think this makes, uh, this makes difference. Um, I would say uh, we are also trying to create uh, vertical tech transfer funds that are very close to the research centers where we see excellent capabilities. And, um, and this is something we're trying to do throughout. So we have now five and we're aiming to build 20 uh, deep tech funds in Italy. And I think also what uh, definitely governments can do with regulation, uh, for example, in the innovation strategy, there is the sandbox regulatory environments. This is pretty good because you can speed up the testing and the validation of specific technologies, things about, I mean, driverless cars or drones or even new type of technologies that unleash in the market, you have to test how they work. I mean, even with AI and specific type of AIs, you need to do that. And I think Europe has this... We have to really understand not only the capacity, for example, the type of Fraunhofer networks that we have advanced research that we are trying to replicate throughout Europe with a program like Horizon Europe that has invested 100 billion in fundamental research and also research and innovation and our industrial capabilities and strengths. So these are all very important with 26% of STEM um, uh, graduates, which I think is uh, higher than in the US, although we have still some uh, gender gap there that we need to fix. So I think with all these capabilities, what we need to really do is exactly what he was saying before to, well, like bridge this financing gap at the very uh, late stage. Uh, we also launched a 400 million um, fund for late stage investment and an international fund because that's where we see uh, a gap, but also the translation of those technologies actually into society and into the market. Um, and I think Europe is also by, by position there with regulation in the single market. So we need to think much more in the single market. And for example, before this job, I was chief technology and innovation officer in the city of Barcelona. We have a network of very innovative cities that are at this point testing green technologies to decarbonize, to create green areas, to create uh, autonomous mobility, electric mobility. Um, you know, they have amazing uh, data infrastructures to create uh, digital services that can scale and even the kind of um, fintech capacity that we have in Europe now with decentralized, uh, uh, decentralized uh, finance, and I would say also the blockchain smart contract kind of environment. We have a lot of amazing security and privacy enhancing researches in Europe. So the potential is there mm -hmm. for deep tech to, to get also... finally, I mean, to produce this kind of big companies that can make into the market and create real value. Yeah. So I, I, like... I, I think it's probably coming, yeah. I'd like to add two things to what you, two very important points that you made. Uh, one was this point about um, <clears throat> scale-ups. A uh, few people know that Europe actually produces more startups than America, so we don't necessarily have a startup problem, we have a scale-up problem. Uh, and uh, the sad thing is that Europe is still very rich. I mean, we've got the money, uh, so we've got an asset allocation problem. We just don't put the money into uh, these uh, uh, risky situations. I mean, the EIC helps, but it's still, uh, it's still not enough. Uh, and I often feel that the biggest risk we have in Europe is that we're not taking enough risks. So <clears throat> uh, that's the point about uh, scale-ups. Uh, but the other point, a uh, very important point that you made, uh, is uh, enlisting uh, corporate venturing from our large uh, companies. Uh, we, we do, it, it, in order to have a really successful ecosystem uh, that produces not just uh, innovative products and services, but also gets them uh, into the market at scale. Uh, you do need the cooperation of um, large companies, and corporate venturing is the right way to do this, and to get the expertise of large companies to inform uh, uh, the startups and the smaller companies of the really uh, important problems that they uh, need to have solved, and also provide access to market because they normally have distribution networks that, of course, are much superior to startups. But how do we do it? I mean, say you want, 
European investors to take more risk. Uh, I mean, there, there's, I mean, for good reasons, European VCs in the past decade or so has been focusing a lot on, on IT software because there's been some amazing returns available there. Uh, but how, how do you get those European VCs to be more curious and more interested and invest more in deep tech? Because it's, I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's fundamentally different to do SaaS companies or do uh, material science or, or whatever it is because it's two different words. Well, uh, um, unfortunately... Are they the, equipped for that? Uh, yes, fortunately, the, uh, <clears throat> the sector distribution is changing uh, because people do realize the phenomenal returns that uh, um, will be associated with uh, you know, creating very successful quantum companies, for example, as you mentioned, or uh, breakthroughs in synthetic biology which, in my opinion, long-term is probably the most important new technology because it will change our health system and the way we look after, after our own um, health and our own uh, our bodies. So, uh, <coughs> and VCs aren't stupid. They, 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 they go after the sectors where they expect the, the best returns. And the good news is that uh, uh, the first time in history uh, European venture capital now gives better returns than American venture capital. And because we're in a capitalist society, fortunately, the money flows into areas where there are the good returns. So fortunately, we get a, a, a bit more money uh, now than we used to in the past. The problem is that the distance to the US is still so big uh, that there's a big gap to fill. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, the last thing I think we were trying to cover here is is European deep tech startups and investors in relationship to, uh, related to, uh, I mean, the, the Green Deal uh, that the European Commission has, the CHIP Act, uh, the focus on material science and material needs. Uh, how, how do you see that, those initiatives compared to what we have in the ecosystem in terms of entrepreneurs, innovations, and, and, uh, and investors? I see them in a very integrated way, and I think uh, actually this flows very well from, the, from what it was just said, uh, because the challenges are so big, and for example, if you look at the uh, Reduction Inflation Act in the US, which is this massive uh, subsidies package for green technologies and for uh, the, green, the green ecosystem in the US, um, I think it is clear that you need a level of ambitious, ambitiousness and also to be very strategic but to mix a lot of instruments. So you need, I think, a, a much more um, um, proactive industrial policy. I think we have been talking about it for a long time in Europe but we never managed to really do it at a pan-European level. And I think this community can show how it is done. Uh, you need to have, well, things like the CHIPS Act. Of course, it helps because Europe has to bring back. I think there is a question about globalization, how it will work in the future. So you think about reshoring, nearshoring, or deglobalizing some of those value chains to make them more resilient, to retain some technological sovereignty in key areas. Uh, you need to be a champion in green technologies without relying, I mean, without having new dependencies where you got rid of old dependencies. So if you think about reducing dependencies on Russian oil uh, to 25% for Europe has been a great achievement. Now you don't want to have new dependencies, for example, when it comes to, um, to clean technologies or raw material from Asia or from China, or dependency, of course, microchips that you know very well in Taiwan. Um, so those are very critical geopolitical and industrial questions. And I think you need the ambitious to have industry alliances like the one we have for batteries, for microchips, for raw materials, for hydrogen. Then you need the scale-up ecosystem. We need to boost it and to fill the financing gap, also train deep tech researchers, uh, one million we said in Europe. And we also need to have mixed fund financing. So we need a blend financing, but also 
uh, large-scale investments, fine, like lar large-scale subsidies. So maybe the President von der Leyen said that Europe needs a sovereign fund, a sovereign techno technology sovereignty fund. And I think this is a very ambitious proposition and is about, you know, giving um, the financing and the strategy needed for the Green Deal to succeed. So maybe a question could be how do we see this happening because I think this community will contribute to a European sovereign fund if this gets um, done. Yes, and the obvious segue to Herman. And, uh, for the Maybe I can right? say, a, uh, say a few things on technology sovereignty since I'm just writing a book on it. Uh, and the reason why I'm writing a book is my experience uh, uh, with ARM and um, NVIDIA and Trump's behavior in uh, the um, <coughs> weaponizing the uh, American dominance in silicon software uh, design. So the, uh, the good news is uh, when American, an American company called NVIDIA was trying to take over uh, a European company called Arm, which uh, I had something to do with, uh, we managed to defeat them uh, because the, the consequences would have been dire. We would have had an American uh, monopoly in microprocessors all over the world, and we would have had to ask permission of the American president to use our own microprocessors. I mean, it, it really was a, one of those horror scenarios uh, fortunately, the Americans themselves felt that this was anti-competitive, uh, and everybody, uh, including the, uh, uh, the very combative, combative uh, European uh, um, uh, competition authority, and to my surprise, also the British uh, CMA, uh, the Competition and Mergers Association, came out strongly against the deal, uh, and we managed to win that. It's one of the rare wins uh, uh, for, for Europe. So, uh, back to the issue of technology sovereignty. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Trump's behavior has been a real uh, wake-up call for Europe, uh, that it is possible to have an American uh, president who uses the dominance uh, in certain technology fields uh, to use it as a weapon against his own erstwhile allies. I mean, who would have thought that America, uh, you know, would, would, would use it as a weapon against Europe? But he did. So, uh, but maybe that was a, a good thing uh, because it, it just made us aware that we have these dependencies on America in, in a small number of technologies. Uh, you know, we, we must not uh, use the argument of technology sovereignty to be an anti-globalization or anti-China or anti-US anti uh, argument. You have to pick uh, the areas where there is a clear asymmetry uh, where we are exposed to economic coercion from either uh, the US or China because they dominate a particular field so much and we've become dependent on, on them. And of course, the, uh, the Russian uh, gas example is, 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 is a reminder of how bad things can get when these uh, dependencies uh, build up over many years. So coming back to your point about the sovereign fund, uh, I've been uh, supporting the idea of a 100 billion technology sovereignty fund for Europe for some time, and we should use it very specifically for, for those technologies that we have to have uh, in, in order to be sovereign. And one of those is uh, chip design software, where we've become so dependent on a duopoly in the States uh, called Synapses and Cadence. So uh, we ought to use some of the money uh, of the EIC going forward and this technology fund to um, close these gaps uh, that we have in Europe on our technology offering. We've been offering. thrown out of stage. Yes, no. it's on its way, yeah. No? <laughs> no. no. Uh, There's three of us and one of him. No, but yeah, can, we're out of time. Can I say just a final word? Because I think this is, is very inspiring, um, this idea that, we, that Europe can do it. And I want to underline the fact that um, Europe until now has been seen just as a super regulatory power in the digital age. But we are saying this is very good but we also need to compete at a at, uh, scientific and technology level with the ambition of where we can do it and have the ecosystem ready to really put those technologies in society, doing with European democracy and European values. Yes, so at the end, if we do it this way, 
I think that's going to be also for the public interest and for the benefit I think so. I mean, of the, society. The, the democracy, the values, freedom of speech and all that, combined with the world crisis research, the, the experience established, high quality, large corporations, the startup ecosystem, the innovators and, and the entrepreneurs, I think that is a very promising combination of skills, I think, that, that we can see in Europe in the future. So, Herman Hauser, thank you very much. Francesca Bria, thank you very much. Thank you. Big round of applause, especially as well to Nicholas. Thank you very much. Fascinating discussions. We have another session coming up right now about how to really have an impact. And this is, of course, taking fundamental research through to commercialization. Um, and to moderate that, we have a tech journalist, the editor of tech.eu, Robin Walters. Together with him is uh, Speller Stress, an EIC board member, and Shiva Dustar, a director of the EIB Institute at the European Investment Bank. So, Robin, the floor is yours. Please bring your guests. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, realize we're in the last session standing in the way of the reception of the dinner. Uh, but we'll try to keep it uh, interesting uh, for you guys. Um, my, as uh, mentioned by Andrew, my name is Robin Wouters. I'm the founder of Tech.eu, uh, covering the pan-European technology uh, landscape for the last 15, 16 years. Uh, very, very happy to join here by uh, three very, very uh, prominent members of the community here at the EIC. Uh, we're going to start with introductions. Uh, I'll start uh, with the ladies, of course. Uh, I've never met uh, them in person, so this is my first time meeting them actually on stage. Uh, Shiva. You are the, the head and director of the EIB Institute. Uh, what does it actually mean? Thank you very much. Well, the Institute is actually dealing with all the uh, non-commercial activities of the, of the EIB, but including also relations with universities. And I will tell you a bit later why, therefore, there is a linkage now to the EIC. Uh, in my former role, maybe very briefly, and I see a lot of faces that are... Um, very familiar, I was head of innovation advisor, uh, advisory and uh, we were basically part of the team that gave a lot of the data to the European Commission why EIC is needed. So it makes me really happy to be here to see actually what has come out of it and it's, um, you know, and EIC is definitely close to our heart at the EIB. Great. That makes it very relevant and uh, you're also the first woman in the role, the head of the EIB Institute, so congratulations for that. Uh, we also have with us uh, Spela Stes. Uh, she is with the Josef Stefan Institute, uh, and she's a the technology transfer expert, essentially. Did I get that right? Should work now. Um, hi there. Uh, apparently my mic is on, but it doesn't work. And yeah, Robin, wh whatever you said, it's, uh, it's, it's correct. And you even managed not to butcher my name. So yes, um, I, I work um, in the field of technology transfer. I'm actually, I'm kind of a technology transfer, knowledge transfer, or valorization, whatever you call it, really fan. Uh, it comes from my heart. I really believe that science and uh, economy should be connected and that science should work in a way for the benefit of uh, the economy. We'll talk about uh, later on also in terms of the commercialization part. Fantastic. And joining us remotely is uh, Kurt Mehlhorn. He's a very well-known uh, German computer scientist uh, with a biography that's uh, longer than most novels I've read uh, so far. But he's here to represent uh, the ERC because he's also a member of the ERC uh, Scientific Council. Uh, Kurt, welcome. Uh, yeah, good stage, afternoon. I so I'm, uh, I'm a computer scientist by training. I'm a member of the ERC Council since six years. I chair the working group on innovation. I'm co-chair of our joint working group with the EIC, and I believe that the link between research, basic research, and in, in innovation is a very important one, and we need to do everything to strengthen it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I very much agree that it's important. Uh, this is also very close to my heart because on a personal level, my girlfriend works in research. She's a biomedical researcher at the University of Brussels. I've been 15, 16 years in the startup community, and I find that whenever we talk in a professional context, it's like we speak a different language. Um, so that's, that's one of these bridges that I think we need to build. 
uh, much more in Europe, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, the title of the session is From Fundamental Research to Commercialization. So we're going to unpack that title a little bit, and we're going to start with fundamental research. What is it? How can we define it? Uh, and how does it relate to the work that the EIC has been doing? Uh, Kurt, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so uh, the ERC stands for basic research. We fund, we try to, fest, to fund the best research in Europe, and I think we're good at it. So basically all the European Nobel Prize winners in the last 10 years are also ERC grantees. A significant fraction of basic research has innovation potential, and we already established uh, 10 years ago a small funding line called Principle of Concepts, where we give our grantees of the main grants additional money to explore transition, to explore commercialization. But these are small grants, and of course, we can only do the first step. So now, when the EIC came into existence, we, we thought it's a very good idea to team up with the EIC to ease the goal, to ease this transition from basic research to innovation. And I think we have made some important steps. The EIC has uh, the funding line, uh, the transition instrument. I refer to it super POX. It's about 10 times the funding of our POX. And uh, in the first round, our grantees have been very successful. We run a series of joint workshops where we bring researchers and innovators together. So I think these are first promising steps for a good collaboration between the ERC and the EIC. And I'm pretty sure that this will ease the transition from basic research to application and to innovation. Great. Well, let's hope so. Uh, let's unpack the second part of the title of the session, which is commercialization. And we have an expert here, uh, Spela, uh, has been in this field for quite a long time. Uh, so let's ask the same kind of question, commercialization. How to define it within an EIC context? Well, what you could notice is that actually Kurt already jumped into the topic. So the words commercialization were already mentioned by him. And it's because actually the two parts are really much connected. You cannot, you, you cannot work with one without the other. So that's also the purpose of the EIC. On one hand side, you have the high level basic research that is going to be pushed throughout the funnel of the EIC from Pathfinder through transition to the accelerator instrument with the view of getting as much as possible from the basic research for the economy. So that's the reason why I really like this instrument because it's kind of connecting the basic research they started, as Kurt said, 10 years ago to with the proof of concept within the ERC, but the, the, the transition and the accelerator instruments are building upon that. So um, we're creating here an environment in which not only the researchers and the um, in innovators can play with their ideas and push them towards the market, but we are playing also with the idea that the Europe as a whole should be able to build the innovation ecosystem that could come part to part with the ecosystems like in the US. And we've heard in the previous session that we are lacking VC investments. We have issues with the the shares of the IP in the companies. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that this panel does not have a gender equality uh, issue, but that's something we could still work on. Um, so in, in terms of the EIC, it comes quite natural that we are focusing more on the accelerator part because that's where the commercialization comes in and it's closer to the market, so it's um, more noticeable. It, it's where the, the actual effect on the community is created. But it, it needs to be emphasized again that the EIC is created as a funnel of instruments where you, you, you from the basic research with, with high-tech potential, you build upon that and you push it through the market. And that's where the commercialization and the research part really connect. Great. Well, thanks for the clarification. Um, Shiva, as a representative of EIB, uh, EIB usually comes in at a later stage of development, I would say. Uh, but of course, in your previous role, uh, you've seen a lot. Uh, so what is your take on this? How can we get 
more research faster out of the lab, more efficiently, uh, and build bigger businesses. Indeed. I mean, this is actually uh, something that study after study, and you can see these studies on the, on the EIB website, um, whether we looked at AI blockchain, whether, look, whether we looked at key enabling technologies, the theme that always would come out is that Europe has scientific excellence. We have uh, among the best researchers, actually in our AI blockchain study, the data was quite compelling. We have more even researchers in AI in Europe, 40,000 compared to 30,000 in the US and 20,000 in China. But then what happens when it comes to R&D in AI? The numbers completely drop because a lot of the AI happens in the US by private companies, in, in China through a lot of industrial strategy, and in Europe we unfortunately don't have these gigantic you know, companies that unfortunately, uh, you know, so that means that we, we somehow do have a problem in really getting these ideas out of the lab. And this is something that also the EIC over time may suffer from because it has a great Pathfinder program, it has the, you know, it has the accelerator and now the transition, but if you don't get the research out of the labs and become companies, convert into companies, the accelerator can, cannot, cannot really come in. So now, how does the EIB look at, look at it? Well, EIB comes further down. We have venture debt. We have all sorts of very interesting financial instruments. If you don't solve the problem earlier on in the system, you just have the bottleneck. Um, from an EIB Institute perspective, and this is something that we will be looking at now more closely with EIC, um, and I think the, the experience really has also been on, on from coming from the advisory experience, it's not enough to just have financial solutions. You need to have additional accompanying measures, support initiatives. And here there is, I believe that, you know, it has been, uh, I get the thumb from uh, Keith <laughs> sitting here, the work program of 2023 has approved a pilot initiative uh, called Executive in Residence. I think those of you who are in the space, you, you know this terminology because it's a very proven concept in the US um, where you have basically a seasoned entrepreneurs, seasoned venture capitalists, executives who become mentors to the researchers, the professors, to help them visualize what it would take to actually form a company, um, you know, and, and really give that additional booster and, you know, whether it is in, in skills, in confidence. And these programs in the U.S. have actually really shown their impact. And so the idea is that we, should pi we would pilot such an initiative. Um, on the EIB side, we still need to now go through our own approval procedures, but um, you know, the, the pilot actually will be a very interesting way of seeing how would you adapt such a scheme to the European reality. And therefore, I'm also here to, in a way, invite those of you who have had experience in this field or really understand what it takes or would actually be one of those potential mentors uh, to, to reach out to the EIC team, to myself, um, because you know, we really need to see how could we actually realize this in Europe. That sounds like a fantastic initiative. Um, we have lovely backs, but I think we're going to turn around a bit and face the uh, other side of the stage. It's such an interesting stage setup. It's uh, quite, uh, quite special for me as well. Um, Kurt, I have a question for you. As an outsider, if you would not be part of the community that's in this room now, and you would hear something like there's a European Research Council, but there's also a European Innovation Council, which seems like it's saying that research is not where the innovation takes place. Like, how do you explain to an outsider why there's a difference between those two? Why are there two uh, bodies at all? And how do they work together? And how will that relationship evolve over time? I think we are uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, we do the basic research, curiosity-driven basic research, but most of the basic research questions, I mean, they do not come out of the sky, blue sky. People want to do relevant research, and relevant research frequently leads to innovations. The EIC does the, is the other side of the coin. It wants to go to the market, it wants to commercialize, it wants to have impact on society. And there is a, a natural link between the two of us, uh, namely that uh, 
things that work out on our side are taken over by the EIC. And, uh, and I want to uh, make a comment on what uh, Shiva said. I think one of our problems is the mindset of our, our researchers. So I, I used to work for the Max Planck Society, and when I mentioned to the Secretary General of the Max Planck Society 25 years ago that I planned to found a company, he told me a Max Planck director doesn't do this. I did it anyway, and uh, fortunately the Max Planck Society by now thinks differently. We are actively encouraged to create companies. But when I talk to my students, I hear they want to go into academia, they want to join large companies, but very few, very few want to start a company. And it's not because they shy away from the risk, it's earlier. They do not even think about exploring, uh, creating a company. So I, I think we need to create an atmosphere where every young researcher spends at least a week of thinking about the exploitation of their research. If after a week of thinking they decide against it, this is fine. But somehow we need to bring them in a situation where they think about it for a week. Uh, I'm, I'm associated with the University of, I'm a professor at the University of Saarland, and we have just started a, a master's program in entrepreneurial cybersecurity where we try to teach the students on the one hand, cybersecurity, and then on the other hand, try to bring them early on in contact with uh, the idea of creating a company. So I think we need to work on the people also. It's not just, uh, I mean, everything that was mentioned before, creating the, the right ecosystem, this is all correct, but we need also, somehow we need to change the mindset of the young people. Yeah, and changing a mindset uh, can be incredibly difficult and can take a long time. But it's definitely something that we need to do in Europe, I agree. Uh, Spela, what barriers can we still tear down to get this research um, faster out of the lab, uh, faster into the market, and build bigger businesses on top of that? Because you mentioned there's already valuable instruments. Those are the positive things. What are some of the negative things? What are some of the, the things that we still need to fight for? So as, as you said, we've already done quite a lot. Because prior to EIC, we had uh, a myriad of instruments that were not that well connected. So it, it was much more difficult for the innovator to access the financing to, to actually do something with the technology and push to the, mar to the market. We do have an issue with the innovation environment as a whole in Europe. Um, the EIC is building from within the business acceleration services and the, one of uh, the most important segments is also the proactive management of the cases within the EIC, meaning that the cases, the, the projects actually get full proactive support in thinking about the, what the next steps could be. And um, with that, they also get further educated and also the entrepreneurs in residence is one of such examples that is going to help the um, innovators to think about the opportunities that their technologies um, give them and to the community. So there's a myriad of instruments that's already being set in place and we should work on that further. So it's, it's very important, the, the initiative of uh, Shiva. I think that in the majority of the universities, also at the University of Ljubljana, we teach the students that they should somehow embrace the entrepreneurial way of thinking because that's what's going to push them forward in their lives. But it's difficult because it's, um, it's a community that is not that open to risk. The, the European community is a little bit different than the one in the US. Um, on the other hand side, we have um, we, in, in the innovation environment that we should be building uh, further in Europe, we have different uh, levels of quality of support that is given to the innovators at their own institu home institutions. Like if we go to the 
the public research organizations where the technology transfer offices are based. Um, so they're, they're, they've been, the name has then later been changed to knowledge transfer offices. And now at the level of the European Commission, even the guidelines are called the guidelines for valorization, not anymore for technology transfer. So the terminology is changing from um, technology push to valorizing from the side of the entrepreneur and to, to somehow embrace this entrepreneurial thinking. But um, if we go back to the innovation environment, there's still much that can be done because we have a different level of support throughout Europe. And the EIC, uh, with the seal of excellence that is giving, is raising then at the national levels already uh, some additional financial support to the cases that have not been granted financial support at the European level, which is very good. It's in particular important for, um, at least I see it in that way, for the widening countries. And through all these segments of work that are coming together, somehow we are trying to build an environment of innovation that is actually going to be vibrant and radiant and is going to proactively support the, the innovators at all levels. Shiva, I've seen you nodding in agreement uh, quite forcefully. Uh, do you have anything to add? Like how can we, what more can we do? Yes, I mean, you know, obviously um, the panel has really the, the experts on the ground, but when I listen to you and when I also now think of having spent a bit more time the last few months trying to understand the U.S. ecosystem, having spent a bit of time in San Francisco or, or speaking to people who are very active in Silicon Valley. What I, what I see, there are a few things that, that sort of come to mind. One is um, perhaps also uh, re referring to that mindset. The mindset comes in at different levels. There's also a level of mindset in the wider community, um, in Silicon Valley of the venture capitalists, of the serial entrepreneurs who see it as a badge of honor to give back and spend more time with the researchers. Um, it's sort of like the philanthropy in the US, right? I mean, if, uh, if your university comes, you know, you spend hundreds of thousands in tuitions to a university in the US, and then they come back the next day and ask for more contributions. And it's, it's a badge of honor in a way. So it's a different mentality than perhaps some of us in Europe would have, right? We would say, hey, I just gave them all this money. Why do they want more money? So looking at it, however, in the context that we are discussing, the, the, to the extent that we can connect the ecosystem better up within Europe, meaning that those who are actually financing, even if they're financing not seed but later stage, see that this, there is a reason for them to come in earlier on and give that market perspective earlier on and uh, you know, of what products, what solutions actually ultimately will sell, will scale up, and do it actually with the university students so that you, you, you create a better um, connection early on with, with um, you know, with the uh, financial world, with a much wider setup. And what I've seen also in the US, the other thing I've seen is it's not just about financing. They bring in salespeople. I've seen that they, they have salespeople mentor, you know, really the, the, the researchers how to sell an idea out to whoever they need to sell it to. I mean, you know, it's, so we do need to think in Europe how to create that environment. Um, where it is okay to learn these skills as a researcher and also be able to see that you may not become the CEO of, you may not want to be, you know, you may not be the CEO of the company, but the CEO could be somebody else. And again, this is where my understanding is a lot of these executives, what would drive them to actually put in that extra time? Because, you know, they may see themselves coming into these roles as well. It's always a give and take. It's a, you know, it's a win-win, hopefully. And this is perhaps something we can maybe test in Europe. Would we have the sort of people in our community, and EIC is therefore a perfect platform, where we connect the researchers to the venture capitalists, to, the, to those who are very good in commercializing and selling ideas. And the last thing I would say is, in Europe we have all these RTOs, the Fraunhofer's, but there are so many others, you know. We're not using them well enough to actually bring 
and I here I use an expression that we've used many times before, to bring science into finance and finance into science. They're at a very interesting intersection, and they could be much better plugged in. But much more to be done. Uh, we're going to turn back around to the other side. Uh, so I'm glad you brought up the US, uh, because I do have a final question. It's a question for all of you. Uh, this morning, venture capital firm Atomico, along with its partners, released its mammoth report on the state of European tech. Um, and I've spent the last few days sifting through the report because it's huge, it's 450 charts, but I did the work for you, so don't worry about it. Uh, but one of the things that really came out um, as a learning for me, and that was very relevant to this panel, is that in the US, whenever a university or a research center uh, spins out a company, the median take of equity is 3.5%. In the UK, that climbs to 10%, so almost three times more. There have been cases, and there, there, I think the study was like 140 spin-outs, where the equity take in the beginning was already above 50, sometimes 70%. So is it only a mindset thing, or is it also the financial incentives that we have that, that are misaligned with what the market actually dictates? Uh, Kurt, do you want to... You want to grab that one I have first? To, I have to pass on to my two colleagues. I'm not an expert on this. That is, that is fair enough. Who wants to take it? Well, I think we're very much different from the UK, at least the Central Europe, and even further away from the US. Um, in our case, we've never taken more than 3 to 5%. I can assure you that. And that's a sensible number. But I think that the difference is that in, during most of the time while uh, the spin-off creation was happening, we didn't have a venture fund that would be uh, governed by the university or the RTO. So we didn't have the funds to invest directly into the spin-off. The spin-off was created, the IP was transferred, but then we couldn't financially assist them, whereas in many US universities such uh, funds exist and they certainly do uh, in the UK. So maybe that's the difference. I'm just responding to your question. I, I didn't do a profound analysis on that. That's okay, but follow-up question, do you think the EIC could take that role of the fund that didn't exist? But the EIC is doing just that in the accelerator phase. So it's supporting these spin-offs with, whether they're spin-offs, they, they could be also startups, to, to, to be granted enough money to scale up at a certain point in time. So the EIC is filling that gap. But I also think that at the national level, the EIC, the idea of the EIC at certain national levels, it has created this positive energy that also the national financing is, has been created to support just that in a similar way. So it, it is, EIC in my eyes has a much broader impact. And success also breeds success, so if the results keep on coming, then hopefully national governments also uh, take uh, examples from that. Um, Shiva, do you want to weigh in on this? Well, I mean, I would just think generally it's also as a supply issue of finance. So, I mean, to the extent that we can, in Europe, have more funds that actually target those spin-offs and create a bit of a competition also with the university so that they come in and, and take, I mean, that's what I also see we have perhaps more of in the UK, in the US. And the question is, why don't we have more of such funds in Europe? It's a chicken egg probably issue as always um, you know they, they may not come because they don't see enough uh, oppo investment opportunities on the other hand um, you know the investment opportunities don't come out because they don't think there's enough financing so we need to somehow and you know break that and that's also of course the role of the public sector I mean we heard uh, earlier in the panel the, the case of Italy uh, but you know we have of course the European investment funds so we need to look at all the instruments we have to increase the supply of financing capital, to go, risk capital, to go into these spaces. All right, we're going to wrap up the session and move to the fun part of the evening. Uh, not that this wasn't fun, but even more fun. Um, so in conclusion, I think we're all in agreement that Europe has excellent research, uh, excellent science being done. Uh, it's still very difficult to get those innovations that happen there in universities, in research centers, uh, to the market. 
but we are working on it. The EIC has developed a number of instruments that are already very helpful. There's more that can be done, uh, but we're all quite aware of the challenge ahead of us, and we're all willing to do something about it. So on that note, thank you, Kurt, for joining us remotely. Uh, thank you, Spela, and thank you, Shiva. That was it for this. Thank session. you. A big round of applause for our panelists. And Robin, excellently moderated. I think when the smell of food starts to come into the stage, it comes very, very difficult. On that note, some of you will have received an invite to the VIP dinner. That is outside and directly opposite. There are some signs, but outside, this way, through the main exit, and then opposite is the VIP dinner a little later. And the rest of us, we're eating and dining and meeting just here. We'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock here at the stage. Thank you.